Well, for our next presentation, again, uh, my wife Jane Raymond is going to speak to you on the, the wonderful work and the life of Albrecht Dura. So, Jane, would you please? Okay. So you're going to do that yeah. when, I'm, when I'm ready. Thanks. Yeah. What's that? Mm -hmm. Oh. Okay. One of the things I, the, re, the, the hope I have in, in, for these conferences might be to bring at least one, hopefully two, artists in whatever realm they pursue as examples for us. One perhaps from history and one even now. I was hoping to do a contemporary, but I, not this first time around, it's too much. So um, the first time I came across Albert Durer, I was very struck by not only the work he did, but his character and how his work did influence the culture around him. And so I wanted to bring him to light today. And I hope we can learn a lot about many artists. But anyway, um, you may wonder at this point, what does all this understanding about art look like in the real world? And there were and are many faithful artists. They enjoyed their work. They even made living a living from it in many ways, not just selling it as a commodity, but also in roundabout ways where people really appreciated what they were doing and what they were saying. And this artist, I know you know, even though some of you may not know you know him. But we did, and you'll see that by the end, hopefully, but um, his work has endured and is still in use today after over five, almost 500 years since he's gone, which is what I'll show, point out at the end. So, but we did use his quote in the, uh, in the promotional video, so I'll just play that video again. What is art, really? According to 16th century artist Albrecht Dürer, art is acquired and learned from God's creation, which sows and bears fruit after its kind. For verily, art is embedded in nature. He who can extract it has it. To answer more fully, what is art? The new Geneva Christian Leadership Academy is hosting its first Reforming Arts Conference on August 10th through August 12th. The conference will be held at the Appomattox Inns and Suites, located in historic Appomattox, Virginia. For more information, please go to reformingartsconference.com. That's reformingartsconference.com. I also want to do a little plug for Dave Sonner. He lives in California, and if you didn't notice, he works for a radio, Christian radio station. His voice is beautiful, so we called on him to do that. We'll set it, just put it on that. Okay, so Albert Dura, this is the quote, believed that God within the natural realm of things has planted or embedded everything about art. We are expected to extract it or seek it in order to really have art, his words. In other words, we can never really have or achieve real art without God. He made it, it's there within his creation, we just have to discover it. I strongly believe that Albert Dura wonderfully exampled all the aspects we've been talking about as far as being a faithful artist, faithful biblical artist, in order to really have, in order to, um, all, all these aspects that we have talked about in order to uh, glorify God. But there's three main points I want to highlight from his example today. The first one is, first of all, his love and his honor toward his Heavenly Father. In other words, his philosophies and beliefs. He modeled a strong biblical character which translates into a right attitude through his work. But that, more importantly, it lasted his whole life. He was very solid. The second thing I'd like to point out is his steadfastness, his commitment. They call it the perseverance of the saints. He did deal with people in the world, and, and sometimes there were issues. And it was always interesting to me, everything I read about him, the books I've been reviewing and, and researching in, he never had, they never had a bad thing to say about his character. There were times where people were using his art, he wanted to sue them, but he didn't. There were times where people didn't pay him. I mean, there were issues like that, and, and he always believed that God's hand is in this, so I'll get through it, it'll be okay. And his, 
the transaction part of that biblical definition <coughs> is truly strong and evident in his life. Also, the third thing I want to highlight is his generational thinking, what he left for the, for the uh, generations after him. Not only how good he was in his art, but what he, you know, while he was alive, but what he also left after he was gone. And how can others build upon those foundations that he influenced? It's important to note all three of these attributes because uh, in order to be a true, a true good Christian, a Christian who does good artwork, a person may possess one or two of these that are in the world, person in the world, but not wholly be committed to Christ. For instance, they may leave a legacy. What kind of legacy are they leaving? They may do great work and have great social skills, but maybe they're doing it for personal gain or for, you know, uh, emulation by other people. They may even have an idea that they that they do hold a Christian value, but still they get caught up in the pagan world. They may believe, they may be lukewarm. There's a lot of people out there that think they want to, you know, serve for Christ, but then they get caught up in the in the art world and, and the, and the um, recognition and the money, perhaps, and so they lose, they lose that real reason, the um, philosophies behind it. But I think Albert Durer possessed all three. So let's begin when he was a little child. Okay, this is the, probably the earliest picture that we know of that he drew. He was only 13. Uh, there wasn't much written down or even he, he didn't keep a journal at this time about his life, but on this inscription it says in German, um, this I copied out of a looking glass of myself in 1484, whilst still a child, Albert Durer. So he recognized himself as a child at 13, which automatically tells you something that he had a respect of that difference, being young versus his elders. We do have some early pieces, uh, early sketches and works that are pieced together about some early things, sketches and letters and things like that that people have written, which historians try to piece together. We do know that his father was a businessman. He was what's called a burger or an influential townsman, part of a counseling board of some sort. So he did have his, his dad did have influence in the county. He had his own business uh, as well. So he was somewhat influ influ influential there. Um, Albert Dura Jr., he's referred to as the lesser. This is how they used to say that. The lesser and then the elder is his father. They have the same name. But he was born in 1471 in Nuremberg, Germany. He was a third child of 18. He, and it's believed that the first two died because nothing's really said of them. And, they, and it's commonly thought that there was another son. But so that meant Albrecht Durer was the oldest of the next 15. Obviously, he was home educated. And at that time, parents either taught their own children or they didn't learn. There, was no, there were no public or taxpayer schools or forced education. But some, there were some free Latin schools starting to spring up around that time. And that was very important to learn Latin because it helped understanding the Bible. So the, the main idea was to get these children and the generation to learn about God's word. Some people opened private schools or offered their own knowledge to others. That's how the learning... What's it telling me? <laughs> Where do you go? <laughs> Not now. Oops. <laughs> Oh my goodness. <laughs> okay, but there was a lot of illiteracy and there were a lot of poor people as well. Another factor at this time was that the Roman Catholic Church was the only religion, uh, organized religion, and they were strongly promoting indulgences and, uh, and other money-making schemes. Now his father, this was actually painted when Albrecht was 19, 
so it was painted a few years later. He was very well respected, as I mentioned, but he was a devout Roman Catholic, but very devout in his beliefs. Later on in life, Albrecht wrote of his father, quote, My dear father was very careful with his children to bring them up in the fear of God, for it was his highest wish to train them well, that they might be pleasing in the sight of God and man. So he had a great respect for his dad. Originally, his father was a Hungarian, and he moved to the Netherlands, where he learned the art of goldsmithing. And then later, he moved to Nuremberg, where he settled and married and established his own engraving business. The jurors were able to enroll Albrecht to a school for systematic learning and uh, reading and writing. Uh, not all the children went. It was a, there was a cost there. I think 15 children going to school might be somewhat of a burden, but Albrecht was the oldest, and so therefore, especially being a young man, he was responsible for the rest of the family, pretty much, when, if his ch if parents weren't around. So um, let me just give you a historical background also at this time period. The invention of the printing press was very new. It took place about 1450, and Albrecht was born in 1471, so it's only about 20 years old by, you probably know, Gut uh, Gutenberg, and that was in 19, uh, 1450. Now, before the printing press, kings would have seals. They were a kind of seal-making uh, means for insignia, like rings and things of that sort. They also carved in stone and brass, um, bronze and blocks. And sometimes they would dupl duplicate designs, but they'd have that mirror image, you know. They did woodblock printing, which is a lot what his dad did. And the movable type started to come about with the inventing of the printing press which also did the movable type, and they would make things backwards so it would come print, print properly. So, but with the printing press here, it was really a great, great next stage in history because obviously the communication would, would broaden and people could make books. And at the same time, though, that the printing press came to be, also paper, paper products were no, <laughs> no longer uh, handmade, individual pieces of paper. China was very big at this. They would, they would make um, paper out of uh, food, maybe banana skins and things like that, and, and sew pieces together, something. Of course, they would thin it out, but something, to, or bamboo and things like that, something to put something on. It was very primitive. So when the pa actual paper came out, as we know it, it really changed a lot. So paper mills started to spring up in Spain and France and all over Europe by the, the early thousands, 1150, that kind of thing. So it's still kind of uh, primitive, but it was more accessible than it was before. So they were able to use it on their printing presses, more of the parchment type that, that we know. So Albert became very good at the trade that his father was teaching him. He was very obedient, but he was really acquiring a lot, lot more of a desire toward drawing and painting. Regarding this change of interest, Albrecht did write later in his memoirs, quote, and my father took special pleasure in me because he saw that I was diligent in striving to learn. So he sent me to the school, and when I had learned to read and write, he took me away from it and taught me the goldsmith's craft. But when I could work neatly, my liking drew me rather to painting than to goldsmith's work. So I laid it before my father, but he was not well pleased, regretting the time lost when I had been learning to be a goldsmith. But he let me be as I wished. And in 1486, and in parentheses he's right, reckoned from the birth of Christ, on St. Andrew's Day, my father bound me apprentice to Michael Wolgemutt, to serve him for three years long. So at the ripe old age of 15, <laughs> he went to, his dad thought he wasted time, he went to be an apprentice at the shop of Michael Wolgemutt. Now what he, this also was made, and later on in 1516, it's signed there on the bottom right, uh, of this man, Michael Wolgemutt, but he was very well, well known in the area. But he, Albrecht remained in his studio for three years, but 
and he learned many things. He learned to handle and be comfortable with a pen and brush. He improved and practiced his skills of copying and drawing subjects from life. And he learned landscaping using gouache, watercolors, and oils. Now, gouache is sort of a mix. Uh, it goes on with watercolor, but it dries permanently. It's mixed with other pigmentation. So it's it was a very useful thing for the printing press. It wouldn't fade if it got dampened and things like that. So he had he had a printing press, but he was doing other things as well in order to put all the art together to be pub published. He learned a lot but uh, in the actual trade, but it also seemed that he had a lot of experience with students and workers at, at that, that wasn't so pleasant. He wrote later on, during that time, God gave me diligence so that I learned well, but I had much to suffer from his lads. But that's all you hear about. You don't know what it was. He was very you know, pretty curt with his writing. Some early projects, though, during this time, we do have, and, and I want to just show his diversity in learning. So this is a young, this is called the Dame. It's 1486, so he just, he was only at this, at this shop maybe a year. So this is a sketch on an old sketch pad, and I couldn't tell you what the German says on that. So, and he hadn't yet signed it if you notice. So it's probably something he just did in his pad. He did early woodcuts. This is four of them. The woodcuts were used in the printing shop for different clients. The first one on the top left is a is a depiction of the sower from the Bible. Then we have on the right of that, the, this is kind of cute, the parable of the moat. In the eye you see the moat coming out. <laughs> the beam coming out. I thought that was cute. Okay, as you can see, he's very raw here. He's still young. Uh, the one on the bottom left is the gift of the Magi. And then to the right is actually taken from one of the books that were made, is Jesus on the Sea of Galilee. Interesting how you're working in, a, in an art studio and they have these subjects, right? This was also in his uh, sketchbook at the time. So it's somewhere between 1484 and 1488. This is a study of the Madonna and his hand, a hand. <laughs> so you see how a sketch pad can have just different things going on at the same time. But you could see already he was very much, ta very talented. But because Wolgemut Studio was such a main hub, it was the largest graphic studio and printing company in Germany at the time. He was very blessed. Abrick was also exposed to and associated with other artists, designers, and cutters, but also other businessmen and clientele as they came into the office and, and to, to get these things made. So he was learning actually that part of transaction that we know the Bible says is, is important, how to relate to people and how to, how to respect others. He was not an isolated person at all. So it was in 1489 when he left the studio, he was 18, and he began his own studies and maturity in the trade, in his own trade, trying to find his own way. And this is one of his quotes, which I think is very inspiring for young people. It'd be nice if something of all things I will know. Obviously he had a very energetic, ambitious, and exciting feeling about his future. So this basically ends his early part of his life. And so of his character, we can comfortably, comfortably say that he was a young man of strongly grounded religious convictions with a healthy respect for his elders. And he also had a great desire for learning. He seemed focused and very ambitious. Traditionally, during this time period, it was customary for a student completed, when, once they completed their apprenticeship, they didn't have they didn't have to go to school for 12 years as they mandate now. They started young to get those rooted, th those talents rooted nice and early. But normally, once they went through an apprenticeship, they did, they did normally go on some sort of travel to learn and to increase their knowledge and understanding from other areas within the field that they love. Um, so in our day, you know, we might equate it to college, but it, they didn't stay within one place. They went all over and they learned to see what other areas were doing that were similar to their, their focus. So this 
This tradition dates back to medieval times. The Germans called it, does anyone speak German? Wanderfair, Wanderfair, something like that. And they're called the journeying years. He was encouraged by his father to travel and he wrote about this trip in his later years. Again, everything comes a little later after his, in his 30s about, when I had finished my learning, my father sent me off and I stayed away four years till he called me back again. As I had gone forth in the year 1490 after Easter, so now I am come back again in 1494 after Tide. that's what he calls it. But before he left, he did paint a picture. That's his mother on the left, and you saw the father already. It was sort of like a going away gift to them before he left. Remember, there were no phones. No internet, nothing, you're gone. They don't even know, sometimes months would go by to get a, a letter. So at 18, he was pretty mature. So between 1490 and 1494, I, I recognize this as his maturing and his practicing his work, his, he's practicing his workmanship and his skills. So it's probable that he started by touring his own homeland, I'm sure. Little is known about this time in his life as, as far as where exactly he traveled and how long. He kept very scattered uh, records here. But we can glean a little bit from different letters and scattered traditions. One old custom at the time was that people didn't hurry when they did this portion of their lives. It wasn't, they weren't on a schedule. If they were in a place for three months, so be it, if they were learning and and, and were really getting into their trade, or if they didn't find much there, they may leave in a week. Usually, such an education would take about three or four years. There were also various letters we can glean from uh, that were written that not only referred to Dura, but Dura made himself. Later in his life, in 1506, he wrote from Venice, and he refers to a previous visit to Venice. So it's strongly believed that he might have gone to Italy at this time as well. So some interesting facts. This was the very early beginnings of the Renaissance period as we know it. I refer to him, I see, I see Dura as sort of a bridge between medieval and Renaissance. He, he crosses that barrier. Leonardo da Vinci was his contemporary. Da Vinci was about 19 years his senior. Michelangelo was 15 years his senior. He specifically referenced Giovanni Bellini. There's a lot of Italian artists uh, over in Venice doing great work, so it's probable, very probable that he went there. I kind of equate Venice as the Hollywood of today. You know, that's like the hub of the art world then, like the hub of the, you know, TV movie industry is now. You would go there to see the influential people, try to make it. It, it was more uh, worldly than other areas in Europe that, as far as artwork goes, the Dutch, and they were just incredible with their artwork. But somehow we all focus on the Renaissance because that's more you know, glorifying to man, but it's another story, another lesson, another conference lecture. So, Al, so his own work also gives us clues to his whereabouts and even more importantly, the way he was thinking and maturing. So he used this time well to capture a lot of the things he was learning. Here in his sketchbook, you see there's landscapes and animals. He sketched new things that he never saw before. Some of these were definitely scenes from Italy as well as from Germany. So there's castles and mountains, strange animals he saw some different views. He did a self, oops, I'm sorry. What did I do here? That's what I'm not. This is a self portrait he did at this time. This is interesting, does he look very happy? <laughs> he actually has a bandage over his head. He might have been sick and um, maybe even missing home, you don't know, but he did do a self portrait of him in that, in that frame and then he did Things like he saw young couples walking. He also did his favorite subject, the Holy Family. This was a pen drawing. This is where his mind was. And it's interesting, you see, I guess that's Joseph sleeping while 
She's taking care of the baby. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was funny. But he also, this is this was interesting because he did, this is very confusing. But it was a pen drawing and he called this Frolickers Threatened by Death. All right, where's my pointer? Maybe I shouldn't, knowing me. Does this come up? Okay. First time he's, okay. So you've got a young couple, he, uh, a couple here that looks pretty pious right here. Just kind of, she's obviously with child. And they're among all this worldliness. Over here on the, on the left, you have a girl that's apparently drunk or something playing around. There's, there's people reveling. But it's interesting that here you have a young man of maybe 19. He's, he's noticing this in light of God's word. And then he also did this, which is dated, uh, it looks like an eight, but it's 1493 of what he calls the baby Jesus. And notice how he signed it at the top. As, uh, I'm pointing that out because you see the A and the D, and those little doodads, they're just, they're just doodads on the sides. <laughs> it's not part of his name, but you see the AD on the side there. So consider some things we can surmise by about him, even from these... This is how important art is too, right? From the, from the artist is what they, they deliver from their heart. So he, his, his appreciation for beauty all around him as we saw in the landscapes and the, his, and the, and the uh, nature, his sensitivity of couples maybe and, and of their love. Maybe he was missing home. Maybe he was desiring a, a wife, you know? He was maybe lonely. We also know, uh, we also can see that he had a dedication to his faith which we see, and his awareness of death and frivolous lifestyles. I think, I think he was very rooted in his, I think it's comfortable to say he was very rooted in his faith. There is another very significant portrait that he made at this time of his Winsentide, which is here. That's in 1493, just within a year before he came home. He was 22 years old. He wears a fancy purple cap and an embroidered shirt dressed well for those days, peach-colored ribbons to, to tie his folds in his shirt. And all this was popular dress wear of the day, and one lady would think he looks very handsome. But also, he's holding a flower, and this is very significant because it's probably a leaf, leaves from a sage plant, which symbolizes fidelity. Now, this picture is believed to be a response to his father's request for him to come home, Apparently, his father arranged a marriage for him. He returned in May of 19, I'm sorry, I keep saying 19, 1494, and he was married only two months later. And he wrote of this exciting time period in his journal later. He wrote, quote, when I returned home, Hans Frey, he was a man that is, a bus another businessman that his father knew, Hans Frey treated with my father, treated, treated, <laughs> <laughs> and gave me his daughter, Mistress Agnes by name, and with her he gave 200 florins, and we were wedded. It was a Monday before Margaret's in the year 1494. That's all he writes about his, his wedding. <laughs> he was a very emotional guy. <laughs> this matter-of-fact attitude was pretty common. You know, there were a lot of marriages made together by the parents, and Agnes Frey was a daughter of Hans Frey, who was an influential man in town, and he owned a business, and he had a lot of status in the community, so it seemed like a good match. So here we start his next phase, now that he's married, and naturally, the first picture he would want to draw was his wife. She looks so young, and, you know, with the braided hair, and I, I, I know she was not too much younger than him, but she did live many years after him, so I, I'm guessing she must have been just a young teenage girl when he married her. But notice here he's got the other insignia on the bottom. See how he signs it on the right? That's pretty much how everyone remembers him. Soon after they were married, a plague hit the area. So Albert took his wife to the countryside to live with her relatives, but he realized he couldn't make a living there. There wasn't anything really supporting his work, so he decided to travel to get some income and also connections for his work. This trip, we know he went to Italy for, and he brought 
but it did bring him many contacts and connections, and more importantly, even recognition, more than he when he traveled as a student just learning. He was only gone about a year, but his work showed a lot of Italian influence. Look at this. Okay, so this he calls the Battle of the Sea Gods. But what's interesting, it must have been a commission because they also made a wood, a wood cut out of it. You see the difference? So that this could be printed. So somebody there in Italy wanted a Battle of the Sea Gods. He drew many new things as well. He drew things like lions. He didn't see that in Germany where he came from. They're obviously um, either caged or some wild pasture he was on. I don't think so, but. And also a lobster. <laughs> That's in his, it's interesting. Everything intrigued him. And he, he continued to draw and paint landscapes as well. Uh, here is a painting during this time, and you see his insignia on top, which is interesting because somewhere between 19, uh, 1494 and 1495, he was changing to this insignia for his work. So it helps us to date his work whenever we see that. Well, after he returned from this trip, it was only a year he did all that work, he embarked on about 10 years of incredible productivity. He purchased a, a, a nice size home in his beloved Germany. He went on other trips, but I won't detail all the trips here, he, in, in order to connect with different people and bring back more money. And, uh, and during this time, he did make numerous paintings and he established his own printing business. All that learning from his dad and his knowledge from Wolgemut, he had all that uh, printing knowledge and engraving knowledge but it's great because his work, his wife worked alongside him, running and, ma and maintaining the live-in students that he had in his home. He was training, training students to work in his studio. Back then, an artist, once they started to get very known, they couldn't keep up with the demand. And they would do, he would, he would the main artist would sketch things out and maybe one artist would do a portion of it, someone else would do another portion, he might do the main portion, and all together he'd look it over and add his touches and that was the finished work. A lot of work at this time wasn't all just by one artist because they had these factories, I guess, but that's how the students would learn for future as well. But the wife, you know, she had to wash, do the food, take care of the food, do all the bedding and and the chores and things like that. So they worked well together. More than 60 engravings and woodcuts were printed on his own presses. He also painted portraits of renowned figures from Germany. So this is Frederick the Wise of Saxony. He was about 25 years old here. Because of his printing ability and projects and the, the talk about his work, you know, like his outfit there. <laughs> It looks um, like the years were not kind to <laughs> <laughs> No, he wasn't 25. Oh, Albrecht was 25. No. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe he was 25, but I know Albrecht was 25 when he did this. Not the age, it's the mileage. Right? <laughs> but he was becoming internationally known now because of the printing press and the things getting out there so people would share a little book or so forth. A few points also to note about his character at this point in life. Even though he was very impressed with Italy and enjoyed the dainties there, that information is very well documented. He enjoyed the parties. He enjoyed you know, tasting different foods. It was all part of life. He, he, he really loved life. And so, and he liked to dress well. He still remained in, lo in and loved his own hometown. He believes that his influence would better serve the people there. And because of his influence, he was able to upgrade Germany in many ways to teach them regarding new techniques from Italy and, and new things he, he saw and learned. So his knowledge that he gained from other areas helped improve the lives of his own people. But he still remained, he, he still maintained his respect and his care toward his own family. He and his wife moved into his father's home their first two years, and then after his father died, he and Agnes took 
the mom to live with them until she died. While he traveled Italy, he, main, he re, maintained the contact and expressed a lot of concern about things going on with his siblings that his mom would have to deal with because he was the older one, remember. He was very responsible, sending money not only to his wife but also to his mother to help raise the children. There was no welfare. You know, this was all your own doing. So as well, uh, so he, he was sending money to all the areas home that he needed. But probably the most significant work at this time during this 10 years of his life, mid-20s to mid-30s, was a, a series of 15 wood cuttings called The Apoc Apocalypse. This book was published in 1498, which was rapidly spreading and bringing him a lot of no notoriety across Europe the fourth wood cutting is it's a little it's a little confusing as design would go because you like to have a focal point but there is a focal point this is called the four horsemen and this was like i said the fourth wood cutting but this is just to give you an idea of how much work went into his wood cutting this is a lot of detail and this was the cover of the book actually i'm just amazed that we have this still so let's consider what was going on at his time period. We have, regarding God's providence even, you have a culmination of better, less expensive pa paper, so it's much easier to print on large amounts of work and get it out. You have the print printing press, which is faster and more efficient than stamping. <laughs> you had the rumblings of anti-Catholic sentiments. And then in 1517, very soon after this, you had Luther nailing his theses on the wall. So everything was coming together at this time period. He was just born and, and living and all set up right in the middle of all of this. So Dora was a contemporary to Luther. Dora was about 14 years older than Luther. But he was well established. He, and, he, and he firmly believed he had this mission when he heard about Luther, why he was at this stage, at this point in his life. So when Luther nailed the theses on the, on the door of the church, Albrecht was 46 and Luther was 34. By the time Luther nailed this, Dora was well established, not only in his abilities and influence, but his assets. So maybe there was a little providence involved there. Now the rumblings of the Reformation and anti-Catholic sentiments were strong at this time in Germany. The 13th woodcut of this 15 was called Babylonian Woman, but it was also called the Whore of Babylon. This, this is, was at the time, a, as he wrote in his writings later, a real direct anger at the church. He saw that a lot of the leaders there as the Whore of, of Babylon and that they would have the um, <coughs> The, the symbolism in here was really great, mostly against the Catholic Church. I just wanted to talk about one or two of those things. You have the cup of, uh, you have a voluptuous woman sitting on the beast with seven heads holding the cup of abomination in her right hand. There's a group of people, some are showing little concern. There's a king pointing at her as he talks and a sleek countryman with a slouched hat staring in horror. A soldier and a woman passing by flippantly, that un, unimpressed. But the center figure type is the boldest thoughts of the day. It's, that's what it stands for. This, let me see if I could just see it on here so you could point. There's a center figure. He's got his hands on his hips like this toward the bottom left a little bit. That represents the boldest thoughts of the day uh, facing this... this uh, woman and he gazes at the monster resolutely and inquiring in contrast with a monk who is alone prostrating himself before the woman so he was saying politically and at that time you know the politics was also the church it was just very interwoven so it, it 
he had to later actually explain, people were getting, starting, not getting angry at him, but people that were in the Catholic Church higher ups were, but Germany in the area he was living in were getting it. They already were angry because there were different things the Catholic Church was doing. Uh, they, at that time, the Pope had also put out a decree that, that people can't make certain pictures or do certain things, and this was angering people. They started to put in more uh, restrictions on what people can and can't do. Okay, so this was the last of his three self-portraits. This was done in 1500. He's 29 years old. So he's in the midst of all this action having uh, going on around him. This is probably one of his most famous. Some say he wanted to depict himself similar, to look similar to Christ in this. He was a man very careful about his appearance, as you could see. He took, well, a lot of care about himself and dressed very well. The influence of the Pope, though, at this time was very a great obstacle for Germany. In 1495, an imperial council there was considering the grievances of the people, it, the imperial councils in Germany. Pope, w w who was Maximilian at the time, issued a decree against publishing unauthorized books because he discovered literature was springing up which was aiming at pushing him out of his seat. However, the one realm that was unnoticed by this pope was the realm of the visual arts. While the pope was enjoying his magnificence and his splendors of his palaces, the tiny little insignificant works of faithful men who used their talents of wood cutting and images were plugging along, working to get the word out all about the atrocities of the religious leaders. Dura wasn't the only one at the time to stir religious beliefs. He had friends. They were producing satirical literature and cartoons, passing it all around Germany. Two of his friends even were brought up to the Inquisition. <laughs> and it was kind of frightening because afterwards, one of them didn't do anything else anymore, but the other one did. But I, I don't know why Dura wasn't, but God was protecting him. Maybe he was just being wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove, but his work was out there. I'm surprised they didn't come to his, his home. But, but he had a wonderful relationship with his fellow countrymen and the leaders there, and they admired him very much. They still pride themselves on the legacy of Albert Dura. But we can't underestimate his influence. After Luther nailed his theses on the door, Dura was one of the first to receive a copy. He must have been influential. He wasn't just a common man. He then recopied it and he began spreading that around. He read it he read it to important figures in the city because of those circles of friends. He was part of and attended various clubs like the School for Poets and local political groups. He hosted many people in his home. He continued to print writings of Luther while the church in Rome was ordering them to be burned. The local leaders were quiet about this. Emperors and noblemen purchased his work. Here's another one. <laughs> Doesn't he look? He was Maximilian in 1519. Dora was 48 years old. He's also known as the King of Germans because of his relationship to them. But he was never actually crowned by the Pope, they say, because the journey was difficult. I don't know about that. I think he was sort of sitting on the fence about what his beliefs were, actually, honestly, from what I've read so far. So that would be a good study. But Albert designed and illustrated and, and most likely printed a prayer uh, book for him. Uh, he did print a prayer book for him. But this is, this is the inside of one of the pages of the prayer book for Maximilian. Prayer books were very popular, and keep in mind, printing was still very expensive. It wasn't like printing presses today. So most people who did get a book were, had to have the money to do that. It was one book at a time, and it was very laborious. So um, most of the political and noblemen would, would get these prayer books, but this is an example of one of them, too. They, they were incredible. Look how tiny that is. Isn't that incredible? But the work that went into this, I guess, Oh, it's just, I thought that was a good picture to show the size. When Martin Luther was released from his vows as an Augustinian monk by the church, Dora and his friends began a group called 
the soldiers of Martin. <laughs> so taking advantage of his influence and connections, he wrote a letter to the chaplain of Elector, Frederick of Saxony, be beseeching the protection of Luther, as he put it, for the sake of Christian truth, unquote, unquote. He also added that if he ever met Dr. Luther, he intended to, quote, draw his portrait carefully from life and engrave it on copper to be a lasting remembrance of a Christian man who helped me out of my great distress. I can only think that it was a spiritual distress. He seemed to have a wonderful life. So I'm thinking he might have been battling this idea of a church which he was so faithful to and also the respect he had for his dad versus the truth of the gospel. He wrote later in one of his journals, quote, O God of heaven, pity us. O Lord Jesus Christ, pray for thy people. He recognized that God's people are everywhere, as he continued, quote, Call together again the sheep of thy pasture who are still, in part, found in the Roman church, and with them also the Indians, Muscovites, Russians, and Greeks, who have been scattered by the oppression and avarice of the Pope, and by false appearance of holiness, O oh God, redeem thy poor people, constrained by heavy ban and edict. So he saw that there was truth to be had, and God's people were everywhere. He didn't just write off anyone because they belonged to a church, but he knew that God's people were everywhere. And he was praying that God would call them out of that. But the Reformation never ended during Dura's lifetime. But the art produced to, uh, during this time is interesting. The Reformation obvious, obviously had an influence on his artwork as well. Okay, so when he was 52 or 53 years old, we have, this is his sketch of Mary Magdalene. This was done in 1523. You see the gentleness and the softness of it. And this was his drawing, a pen drawing of the Adoration of the Magi around the same time, about a year later. Compare this to what he did 15 or 20 years earlier about Mary. See the difference? This was a Catholic influence. Abbott made known his righteous disdain of worldly rulers of the church. One of his quotes was, all worldly rulers in these dangerous times should give heed that they receive not human misguidance for the word of God, for God will have nothing added to his word nor taken away from it. Another very famous painting that he made during this time was the Four Apostles. And this was, uh, he, this was really loved because not only for the humanness of the apostles without the halos and, and all of that, but just his, his, uh, his ability, the way the drapery goes and the softness of his colors. This is actually, in his mind, John, Peter, Mark, and Paul. It was an oil painting on wood panels, measured about seven feet high by 30 inches wide. There's so much more about this man as an excellent example of Christian portrayal of the visual arts. Aside from his impeccable character, Unlike today's depiction of artists, he loved and cared for his family all through his years. He was unafraid to share his faith with others, personally and through his art. And he was involved with people and issues. He wasn't isolated. He used his talents to serve God and man and as, as his father had trained him. Here's just one at this time, a sketch with chalk and pen. He remembered just the common folk. This is just called an old man. In his later years, he mostly concentrated on writing and, and less on his actual pictures. As he, this is the generational legacy he started to do, mostly after he reached about 50, late 40s, 50s. He made a multitude of manuscript, manuscripts dealing with human proportion and form, which were eventually published in 1532. He had died in 1528, so they weren't yet published when he was alive, but they published it in four volumes, and it's simply called Albert Dora's Human Proportions. This is the title page. Just to give you an idea of the kind of work he did, this is uh, a page on, oops, I'm sorry. That's a page on human body form. This is a page on proportions of the head. 
And this is a, a, on the form and proportions of the human hand. So he really saw his art as also a science or a, or a math, a mathematical science. After all this quote, I mean, I'm sorry, after all this work, he, it seemed that Dura found it hard to standardize a human form. He, he quoted, no single man can be taken as a model for a perfect figure, for no man lives on earth who is endowed with the whole of beauty. The creator fashioned men once for all as they must be. And I hold that the perfection of form and beauty is contained in the sum of all men, which I thought was a really nice thing. He also made a book on the science of perspective drawing. Before this, artists were drawing what they saw and tried to get that perspective, and it was kind of kind of off. <laughs> if you ever look at the Middle Ages, you could see. So, um, and it was very math with his mathematical thinking, it's still renowned by scholars and scientists from our day. And so, as you could see, this is an actual portion of one of his books, a page of one of his books. He's starting to understand as things get further away, they get smaller. Here's another page, how detailed he's getting with triangular measurements. And another one with circles go into ovals as they go further away. You can see as, as they widen, they would come to come closer or seem closer to us. And that's that Fibonacci rule <laughs> with the spirals and the perspective as you go away. I mean, this took a lot of thought. He was no dingbat. <laughs> you ever see artists today? Really, I, they'd look at this, they wouldn't know what they're talking about. They wouldn't have the slightest idea what's going on. They just splatter paint on, just drives me crazy. Anyway, when he died in 1528, he left his wife a handsome estate. Their house, which was per this still in, this is in Germany, is now a museum, but he purchased it in 1509. He did die in uh, 1528. His workshop was in there, and his wife remained there for more than 30 years after that. So she lived to be a lot older than he did, but it's now a museum in, in Germany. And al although they never met, Dura, Dura and Luther really worked side by side, didn't they, in God's vineyard. It's just amazing. So responding to his death, Luther wrote this, quote, you may count him happy that Christ so enlightened him and took him in good time for, from stormy scenes, destined to still become stormier, so that he who was worthy of seeing only the best should not be compelled to experience the worst. So may he rest in peace with his fathers. Amen. They really loved each other, but sadly they never met. But just to prove that his work and any good faithful artist's work is never done in vain. Even though Albert Dura lived nearly f over 500 years ago, his work is still admired today. His woodcut here of St. Jerome. He did in 1514 when he was 43 years old. Anyone recognize that one? Coffee shops use this a lot. But this one's probably most famous, Praying Hand. So that's why I said you know him even though you don't know if you know him. This, there's a lot of stories behind the Praying Hand. Some thought maybe it was his mother's, others, others thought maybe his father or something. But actually these hands, it's interesting. This was actually a sketch in one of his books, but these hands were used, he studied them as, a, as part of an altarpiece in, in Germany. This is a triptych, which they have three, three panels, two smaller ones on the side, a large one in the center. But Dura only ex executed the center, so probably his students or other artists did the sides. But right in the center, uh, well, the original one was destroyed by a fire. This is actually a copy which was made, obviously when it was still around, but it happened to be made, not all his stuff was copied, but this was copied and right on the bottom right you see a praying man there and that's where the, the hands were used and this is a close up of it. But from his sketchbook, is what most people have photographed from. So why is this little portion of an art piece, this hand, 
stood the test of time. And I believe it contributed to Durer's whole character as well as his art. It was a testimony of the Reformation. Could it be because he was faithful and God honored his work? Could it be because it's just what God wanted us to remember, to pray? Albrecht Durer died on April 6, 1528 in his beloved Nuremberg at the age of 57. So I want to leave you with this and a last quote from Durer. It says, Brethren, let every man wherein he is called therein abide with God. He never forgot God. He didn't get caught up in his popularity or notoriety. He, he remained faithful, and that's so important to keep your head straight, especially when people adore you and want to know your work. But this is a quote from him. If a man devotes himself to art, much evil is avoided. That happens otherwise if one is idle. But isn't this sad today? Because today it's all opposite. They say if you devote yourself to art, it's frivolous, it's foolish, and it's um, not. there's no point to it. We've come a long way, and maybe hopefully we'll be able to um, turn it around. Thank you.